Family is the foundation of our lives. It brings joy and a sense of belonging. 17% of couples suffer in silence with infertility. The stigma ends now. It'll Happen by 30 by infertility advocate Marlene C. Doriso offers a ray of hope. The book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and online at mcdbe.com. Hello, Fertility Show Africa attendees. As much as I would have loved to attend in person, it is a pleasure and a privilege to virtually present and meet you all today. My name is Marlene C. DeRoso, and I am the founder of MCD Business Enterprise. I am a fertility advocate and author. I'd like to share some insight on infertility. A topic we all agree is surrounded by taboo, brings unwarranted shame to men, women, and couples, and often not spoken about. New data was released by the World Health Organization indicating one in six couples globally, that 17% of couples are affected by infertility. As disparaging as this statistic is, it establishes solace in knowing couples are not alone on their family building journey. With so many people affected, shedding light on this phenomenon can lead to provisions necessary to help and support those in need. One thing we can all agree on is to expect the unexpected while on the infertility journey. In my case, one of my unexpecteds was my rusty, dusty cervix. Yes, I had no idea incompetent cervix was a big problem prior to me trying to have a baby. The cervix is the lower part of the uterus that opens to the vagina and is normally closed and firm. Incompetent cervix, now referred to as cervical insufficiency, occurs when cervical tissue causes or contributes to the premature birth or the loss of an otherwise healthy pregnancy. More times than not, a woman can't even tell if she has incompetent cervix because it usually presents with no symptoms. During the second trimester of pregnancy, painless cervical dilation and bulging fetal membranes are often the most common signs of incompetent cervix. Incompetent cervix may be congenital in nature or acquired and happens in about 1-2% to of pregnancies. 25% of babies are miscarried in the second trimester because of incompetent cervix. A cervical cerclage is commonly placed in incompetent cervix patients and helps prevent premature labor or miscarriage that is caused by cervical insufficiency. The cerclage is used to stitch up the cervix close with strong sutures and is successful in 85 to 90 percent of cases when it's used. Now that we've covered some of the facts, let's get into how incompetent cervix affected my personal infertility journey. Again, I had no idea incompetent cervix was such a problem and I'd be impacted by it. My husband and I tried for about nine years via natural approaches. This included ovulation stimulation cycles with Clomid, insemination, which is IUI, IUI with injectables, various surgeries, etc., to try and have a baby. Nothing worked. We finally agreed it was time to move on to the next step in our journey, in vitro fertilization, also known as IVF. As luck would have it, we were successful in getting pregnant after our very first IVF procedure. That in itself was nothing short of a miracle, especially after having tried and waited for so long. At some point, thoughts of despair take over because you think it's just never going to happen. Well, it happened. As I progressed in the pregnancy, I just kept checking off my timeline and marked every milestone until we got to the exciting day of meeting our baby. After finding out the baby was a girl, I was elated because I actually wanted to have a girl. 
Little did I know, a couple of weeks after that amazing appointment, picking out names and finally feeling secure enough to even think about a baby shower, we were going to face the fight of our lives. Or rather, I'd be fighting literally for my life. I got up one morning to prepare for work, and as I went to use the restroom, I passed a clock, the size of maybe a nickel, but smaller than a quarter. There was no other bleeding, no pain, nothing. Because I had experienced bleeding earlier in the pregnancy, now that's another story for another segment, I thought even though I was in the second trimester, maybe it was remnants from earlier. I arrived at my office and began just not feeling well. Again, I had no pain, but I just felt off. It was kind of like the feeling of slight nausea, a feeling like you're experiencing the onset of a cold. A little nauseated, lightheaded, almost like an upset stomach that comes with reflux, although I had no actual physical symptoms. I don't really know how to quite describe it, but I can recall like it was yesterday. Given that I had passed the clot, I decided to call the doctor. I did so immediately and was advised to come into the office. Still with no worry about anything, I went into the office waiting to see the doctor with notes in my hand ready to discuss my birth plan. The doctor ordered an ultrasound right away. And after reviewing it, she came to the office to speak with me. Now, side note, I have to say, I saw nothing out of the ordinary on the ultrasound. When you're an infertility patient, you kind of learn what to look for on the screen. Plus, I was just happy to see the baby and she was having a great time, so I was satisfied. The doctor explained that my cervix was dilated two centimeters. I was in shock. <laughs> After asking some questions, I gave consent to surgery to place an emergency cervical cerclage. The surgery was a success, but I was not able to go home afterwards as planned. I began having contractions and it was not safe to send me home. Needless to say, the contractions did not calm down until I was placed on a magnesium IV drip at the hospital. After about almost three weeks on hospital bed rest with the magnesium IV drip, I began to feel ill and feverish on one Sunday afternoon. Well, things escalated quickly. Although I had been having my blood and urine drawn twice daily to check for signs of infection, I guess that Sunday was the day for it all to show up. Pretty much I went from being fine to having sepsis. The level of white blood cells in my body was beyond critically infectious. Now, what did that mean? I have to deliver our baby girl. It was either her or me. Because I was only 22 weeks at the time, the decision was made for me to deliver as even if we tried to perform heroics, the rate of survival for a 22 weeker was extremely low, pretty much non-existent. I endured a 13 hour labor and vaginally delivered Angel Grace on December 22nd, 2011 at 22 weeks and one day. So in spite of the cerclage, cervical insufficiency was responsible for the premature delivery and ultimate loss of our daughter. Instead of bringing a baby home, I went home with a purple box. After trying for so long and finally achieving success with our first round of IVF, our dreams were not realized. To say that experience was devastating was an understatement. Faced with the decision to try again, my husband and I embarked on our second IVF cycle and found success again. Because of the first experience, I was petrified and filled with agonizing fear at each and every step of the pregnancy. I had to switch to a high risk pregnancy doctor because of my past experience and because we were expecting twins. 
Yes, two. So that meant even more was at risk. When I reached the 12 week mark, a preventative vaginal cervical cerclage was placed. But again, at 22 weeks, I started having those same feelings as I did in the first pregnancy. The doctor found that I had dilated four centimeters in spite of having the cerclage in place. Therefore, another emergency surgery was performed to remove the cerclage I had placed at 12 weeks and replace it with a new one. I remained in the hospital until I started contracting again. Even though on bed rest, we delivered our twin boys via C-section at 26 weeks and one day. They had a close to four month NICU stay and although things were very, very hard in the beginning, they are doing great as 10 year olds now. This time around, incompetent cervix almost stole my joy, but we got through it and I was able to deliver my first set of children with the help of a cerclage after IVF. Finally, in an effort to complete our family, my husband wanted to try for one more child. I was totally against it because of my past experiences. I simply couldn't live with going through those traumatic experiences again. I did some intense research, talked to four medical professionals, and decided to undergo a surgery to have a permanent cerclage placed before even trying to have a baby. Although more invasive, the transabdominal cerclage, which is acronym TAC, T-A-C, is what I had placed. I have only been able to get pregnant via IVF, so this was risky for me to do the surgery and have this TAC thing placed without knowing if I'd even be successful at conceiving again. Needless to say, we tried again. After a frozen embryo transfer that resulted in an unexpected early miscarriage and a failed IVF cycle, we got pregnant with our last baby boy via another frozen embryo transfer. The pregnancy was uneventful. Although scared almost every single day of the pregnancy, we got through it. Because I had the permanent cerclage, the TAC, because it was placed, delivery for me had to be via C-section since the cervix was closed from the top base of the cervix and not the lower part like the vaginal cerclage. Although a risky surgery, I'm happy I went through it. Incompetent cervix brings a fear that can be described with the notion of walking and living your life normally and at any moment with no pain, no warning, nothing, and your baby could fall out. That's just a terrifying way to live. That is what my infertility journey looked like with incompetent cervix. Some tips that I would give to anyone who is on the infertility journey when seeing your provider, because you will have many appointments, please make sure to ask that they check your cervix. Any slight change in your cervix needs to be addressed. Also, ask questions of your family. Did anyone else in your family experience incompetent cervix? That may be your contributing factor. You just never know. But advocate for yourself, ask questions, and get that cervix checked. I am out of time, but more details can be found about my journey in my book titled It'll Happen by 30, A Relentless Journey of Faith, Delayed but Not Denied. The book is here to serve as a resource for anyone experiencing infertility, if you know anyone going through the struggle, and if you're a medical professional that would like to provide an additional resource to your patients, coming from a person who has lived it and experienced it firsthand. I now serve as a fertility advocate and I'm here to help. Reach out to me on IG, which is Instagram, at MCDBE, on Twitter, MCDBE underscore, my YouTube page, Marlene DeRoso, and my website, MCDBE.com. Thank you so much for your time and thank you Fertility Show Africa for having me on this platform.